Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Just Infrastructures Fall 2021 Speaker Series. My name is Kiri Karohelios, and along with Anita Chan and Indy Gupta, my fellow co-leads of the Just Infrastructures Initiative, we will be your hosts for today's event. For those of you who don't know us yet, Just Infrastructures is an initiative created by researchers to interrogate the complex interactions between people, algorithms, and AI-driven systems. You can learn more about us and see more information about our next event, which is Shana Zuboff on October 27th at our website at just-infras.illinois.edu. A link has been added to the chat. You can see our full fall calendar of talks there, as well as last spring's recordings. We'd like to thank our funders, the Computer Science Department at the University of Illinois, the School of Information Sciences at the University of Illinois, the Granger College of Engineering's SRI program, Capital One, and the Community Data Clinic for supporting this programming. We have a long list of non-financial co-sponsors, and you can see them on our website, and we would like to thank them as well. We are also simulcasting in the Siebel Center for Design, our new building, the iSchools Room 126, and the CS8CI Lab. And thank you for those meeting space accommodations. To ask a question, you can use the Q&A box. For our live audiences in the Siebel Center for Design, in the iSchool 126, and in the CSHCI Lab, please feel free to use a question strip and return that to the room's host. We'll go through the questions at the end of the talk. Please feel free to also indicate what unit, department, or organization you're coming from when you submit your question. Closed captioning and American Sign Language support is also available throughout the talk. You can request any tech support in our chat. This talk is being recorded and we're also live tweeting the talk from the hashtag, hashtag just infrastructures. I'd like to now ask you to join me in a land acknowledgement. As a land grant institution, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign has a responsibility to acknowledge the historical context in which it exists and the exclusions and erasures of the indigenous peoples on whose lands it is located. We are currently on the lands of several nations, including the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankasha, Wea, Miami, Maskutin, Ottawa, Sauk, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw nations. This acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to begin the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. Acknowledgements invite us to ask, what does it mean to live in a post and neo-colonial world? What did it take for us to get here? And how can we be accountable to our part in history? We'd now like to introduce our esteemed presenter. We are extremely honored to have Kit Walsh with us here today. She is a senior staff attorney and assistant director at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, where she pursues impact litigation and policy to protect the rights of activists, journalists, researchers, and all people who are subject to new technologies. Her work includes protecting the autonomy of technology users, online expression, and the due process rights of criminal defendants and others who are processed using algorithmic decision-making tools. Prior to joining EFF, she led the civil liberties practice at Harvard Cyber Law Clinic and previously cut her teeth litigating private disputes. She holds a JD from Harvard Law School and a BS from MIT, where she worked on making us all interconnected cyborgs until she realized what a bad idea that would be given our current systems of power and decided to pursue social change instead. I should also note that she's a designer of games. Um, she holds, wears many hats. Um, <laughs> But without further ado, I would like to welcome Kit Walsh. Um, Kit, the floor is yours, and thank you. Thank you. Thank all of you so much for having me. It's wonderful to be able to be here and engage with the community that you've been uh, creating. I would like to talk to all of you about what human rights advocates can do to combat automated injustice, in part because all of you can be human rights activists or advocates. Um, I am uh, an attorney at EFF for this talk. The views <clears throat> I'm expressing are my own, um, but to tell you a little bit about EFF and the organization where I'm situated, 
We are a member supported nonprofit organization and our mission is to do the things that uh, Carrie read in my bio, uh, to protect people's civil liberties in light of technological change. So we have staff technologists, we have organizers as well as attorneys and people who primarily focus on legislative theories of change, trying to establish new law through Congress or state legislatures. And the phrase impact litigation may not be familiar to everybody, but what it entails is taking on a case in the hopes of getting a ruling that, that will benefit everyone, that will benefit people more broadly than just the individual litigant in the case. So we're trying to establish a rule that is going to protect people from government overreach or another form of explo exploitation. And that is primarily a theory of change that lawyers are working on when we are doing our litigation work. I'm going to talk also about some other public interest legal work that we and other organizations do that's about direct client services. Um, so we will, we will come back to all of these theories of change. And as an organization, I can say that EFF policy is pro cats. So you will notice a cat theme. We may get a visit from some of my assistants who are cats right here uh, with no prejudice to dogs, but let us uh, get into it. So at EFF, we do a wide range of civil liberties work that ranges from privacy to freedom of expression to um, the uh, legislative work that I mentioned before and speech and our algorithmic and AI work entails both using existing legal frameworks and theories to prevent injustice, uh, protecting privacy as a potential input to manipulative systems or systems of control, as well as legislative potential solutions around all of these things. What I'm going to focus on for the first part of this conversation before we get to the twist is the use of existing legal frameworks primarily. And there are a couple of reasons for that, um, which are on this slide. So uh, one is we want to help people right now, right? So we both want to be thinking in the long term and addressing problems that require longer term and larger solutions. But we also, when people are experiencing injustice, want to be able to provide relief. And when we identify a legal tool, whether it's well established or something that we are trying to establish through impact litigation, then we will typically have a component of trying to help people in the immediate moment. One of the other reasons I want to talk about this from a practical legal advocacy standpoint for the first part of the presentation is because understanding the promise and the downsides of these approaches informs not only future legal changes, but also practice um, in generating and deploying the technologies. So none of this is with the intent of deterring the pursuit of other theories of change. None of this is saying, well, we have this, this legal theory and so we don't need any more uh, solutions to be thought of. That, that's not the thrust of this at all. Um, and in the end, we're going to talk a little bit about that bigger picture that I mentioned, which is how does this fit in to a greater theory of change? So the first thing that I want to uh, focus on before we get into a few case studies is the importance of uh, the context that an algorithm is being used in to approaching uh, how to govern or whether to use it, in part because uh, tools do have many uses. So that is not to say that you can never foresee the consequences of creating a technology and therefore don't worry about it. You heard from my intro that I was working on a technology that I concluded would not be a good thing for, for the world right now. Um, but it is to say that when we are thinking about it from the standpoint of a potential regulator banning something, then it is very important to think about what are the potential beneficial uses 
and what will the real world consequences of a ban be? So the question of should it exist versus should it be banned are not the same question. They don't fall along the same line. Um, and there are a few factors, some of which are, are sort of widely talked about in AI assessments, like the high stakes question. So you know, is a bad decision from this algorithmic tool going to seriously harm someone? Will it be an annoyance? Um, then of course the power of the actor who is deploying the tool and that impacts sort of every other factor, both sort of what high stakes it can be, how easy it will be to get accountability, how easy it will be for people to mobilize and influence those decisions. And then there are a couple that are um, not always part of the analytical frameworks. One is where do the consequences of a mistake fall? If they don't fall on the person making or using the tool, then you have a much more increased risk that the tool will make mistakes because they are not paying the price. They are in control of the tool. The price is falling on somebody else. And that's a really helpful first heuristic when approaching one of these systems to uh, think about that hazard. Um, there is a limit to how useful it is because usually the consequences do not fall on the user or the maker. They fall on the person who is subject to the tool. So we are going to talk quite a bit about um, cases where the potential for errors are harmful to someone subject to the tool, not someone who's making a purchasing decision or who's programming the tool. Uh, and that feeds into the incentive structures, but there's more to that than just where the consequences fall because you, when you deploy a technology in the hands of police or prosecutors, what are their career or ideological incentives going to lead them to do? And this is part of why we see tools being used outside of their intended scope or with crummy inputs uh, where police will take a blurry photograph or a photograph of Woody Allen throw it into the facial recognition thing, get some hits, and then a cop will say, oh yeah, that's the guy, I recognize him. Um, and that is ideally not the use case that was intended by the makers of that piece of software, but it is a very foreseeable consequence of sending that tool into the world. So speaking of criminal prosecutions, I am going to start by talking about a uh, form of algorithmic tool that are sometimes called forensic tools, but they are used to either generate leads or analyze evidence with the goal of um, contributing to a criminal prosecution, so establishing someone's guilt. And the case study that I'm going to focus in on, because there's been actually a lot of litigation around it, is a form of complex DNA analysis that's called probabilistic genotyping, which I will talk about in a moment. Uh, I've listed some of the key legal cases right here if you want to search for them in your favorite search engine and uh, take a look, but I will also be, be summarizing the issue. So this uh, probabilistic genotyping is not what you might think of when you think of DNA analysis in a criminal context. So it's not, we've got somebody's blood or we've got uh, um, saliva and we think it came from a single person. And so we're going to see what markers are in it and compare it to our suspect. That's not what it is. Um, it is instead a tool um, that is used when you think that your sample from the crime scene or the evidence reflects the DNA of multiple contributors. So it could be a purse that lots of people handled. It could be blood that has multiple contributors. And you uh, don't necessarily know even how many people contributed to it, but you're trying to figure out whether your suspect's DNA contributed to that mixture. So what you do is uh, you take the mixture 
and you figure out what genetic alleles are in it. And those alleles are, an allele is basically a flavor of a gene. So a gene can have different uh, flavors that might give you blue eyes or brown eyes. And you um, figure out which ones are present at particular markers that have been determined to vary across the population. Um, and the most fundamental underlying principle is if I bled three times as much as you did into this pool, there's three times as much of my DNA. Um, and when you, when you look at uh, these alleles, they will come in pairs because that's how our DNA works. And so you can say, aha, there is consistently a bunch more of allele one and four and allele two and three. Um, so we think those came from different people. And that means if the suspect uh, has allele one and two, because we each have a pair, then this tends to indicate that they were not a contributor because uh, it looks instead like we've got someone who's one and four, someone who's two and three. Um, so that is the version of this that you can do just by eyeballing it. And then you get into the real world and you run your uh, PCR gel and you get lines that look like this. Um, and at this point, you look at number one and think that's really low. That might not be a real part of the DNA that was actually in the mix that might have drifted in from the lab uh, or it might be accounted for by another uh, sort of part of the noise that's part of working in disciplines that are that are gooey and imprecise like biology, particularly when you're collecting your samples from the real world. So you could look at this, you can say, well, one and three are kind of low and two and four are kind of high. So maybe, maybe those are the pairs that we should be looking at. Um, or maybe you just have more of four because both of the contributors had it and one is an artifact. Um, and these are the kinds of profiles that you would get that traditionally, uh, when people were sort of doing this by eye, they would say, I can't analyze this. I can't figure it out. Um, so probabilistic genotyping software uses statistical databases of um, how often different alleles appear together uh, and run uh, different possibilities for what the contributors could have been. They will often, you, it's, a, it's an oversimplification to use just four alleles, there are a bunch of them, um, and they will run different cases. What if it was two contributors? What if it was four? Um, and all generally with the assumption that everyone was unrelated, because if people are related, that changes the probabilities that people are going to share a gene um, and then is going to change the outcome of this tool. So um, I'm going to take a brief diversion to the Constitution. So pictured here is a lawyer asserting your constitutional rights to ensure that in a criminal prosecution against you, any scientific or expert evidence is sufficiently reliable that it's fair and just to use it in the proceeding, as well as your rights to confront the evidence against you, which means to interrogate its validity, ask a witness a question, look at documents, and a general Sixth Amendment right to have a fair trial. So those all come into play when you have a tool that's trying to do that complicated thing that I just talked about on this slide, and takes in this input that a person, an expert, cannot really make sense of and says it's very likely that this person's DNA is in there. And then sometimes just on the basis of that tool, uh, you will get a conviction. And these are often very high stakes cases, but you know, any criminal prosecution is a relatively high stakes case. So the, the inquiry around scientific evidence is really focused on whether it's sufficiently reliable that it's fair to use. And if it's not, then it will not be admitted when um, the prosecution wants to use it against you. But the thing that I wanna highlight here is um, even if a technology is widely accepted in the scientific community, there is no technique that is so intrinsically reliable or widely accepted that it defeats your individual right to confront the evidence against you. Like It might not be worth your time if it's clearly a reliable process, but 
as a criminal defendant, you don't have to take anybody's word for anything. You get to confront them. And that's part of the protections offered in the constitution. So why might these DNA analysis tools be unreliable? Well, I've seen examples where they only use Caucasian gene frequency and then over police communities of color. Uh, so that in a more general case is you've used bad inputs or training data. So these aren't machine learning systems, but I'm generalizing uh, to, to that kind of scenario, what these uh, unreliability factors that come up in this context would be more generally. Uh, it is sometimes known to not be reliable or has not yet achieved any evidence of being reliable for certain kinds of mixtures. So if you've got too many people's DNA, then it can't figure it out. If the traces of DNA are too small, then by the time you've amplified it, so you've basically reproduced the, the molecules a bunch of times, it's not reliable enough. So this is a situation where a tool would be extended to a context where it no longer works. A lot like the police officer who throws a blurry side profile uh, photo of somebody at night into a facial recognition um, machine that dutifully spits out results, but isn't, isn't particularly reliable. Uh, it might be just not used correctly. And that could be intentional or unintentional in the general case. Um, and uh, there are the potential, as all of you in the computer science department know, for software to sometimes have errors. Uh, so this is really significant because a, the alternative that's proposed by the vendors of these machine of these machines is well, you don't need to look at how the thing works because we told you how we were how it worked. We told you what we programmed it to do, and therefore it does what we think it's going to do. And so you shouldn't bother to look at it. Their other argument is that they have a proprietary interest uh, that if this technology, uh, if the code were disclosed, then valuable secrets would become known to their competitors, uh, which, is a, which is directly at odds with the claim that this technology is so well vetted and well understood in the field that uh, it ought to be admitted and there's no reason to look at the code. So you've got both the technology that's said to be really broadly reliable, but also contains valuable secrets. So um, I've, I'm using code here as a stand-in generally for um, documents related to the development of the software. It's great to get the look at the code, but particularly in a uh, more generalized context, you also wanna get development documents, training data and methods. Uh, you will often hear a claim of when we're talking about transparency for a large tech company, um, we'll say you, we, would, we would like to know how this algorithm is making recommendations or flagging um, speech for uh, moderation. And the claim will be, well, no one knows that. We can't explain how our system makes decisions. There is no way to give you that transparency. Um, and that is proving a bit too much in the sense that they know something, they are making decisions, they are running A-B tests, they are measuring metrics and choosing what those metrics are, what they're optimizing for. And that's all information that could be a part of transparency to helping someone understand what that technology does. So right here, we're talking about a context where it's a criminal defense team. Um, so it's not the defendant, they're usually not um, computer science experts but they are allowed to retain an expert to, um, to look at this stuff and figure it out. And there's a wonderful example, one of my favorite cases in this field, um, which involved really good work by the New York Legal Aid Society on behalf of um, their client, Kevin Johnson, where the state was using uh, one of these DNA tools called the Forensic Statistical Tool to um, try to establish Johnson's guilt. And they had validation studies, they had peer reviewed papers, they had testimony from the people who had made it. Um, so they said, 
why do we need anything more? We've already, we've told you everything about how it works, but, well, it turns out, I'm gonna tell you the punchline a little early, they didn't know everything about how it worked. And one of the reasons is that peer review is not a substitute for um, an expert and adversarial audit of a system. Um, now, uh, you know, uh, you might also assert if you are a vendor of one of these tools that once you have a peer reviewed paper, that means that your views are generally accepted as true in the scientific community. Uh, but I think that is probably not the experience of people who are actually engaged in peer review publications. But it is something that they say to judges that judges will sometimes take seriously because it's not always clear what um, these norms of scientific discourse mean. And peer review, sure, it sounds like a bunch of people who are also scientists um, you know, did some form of review and that sounds hard and judges will sometimes defer to that. Um, so anecdotally, we, we were in a fight over True Allele, which is another one of these softwares. Um, and I was looking at the things that they cited as validation studies and they were all published by, the vendor was a, an author on all of them, except for one, which was done by a former cop. Um, and you know there weren't an overwhelming number of them, but that's not independent. That's not adversarial. That's someone who has an interest in a particular result. And we know from years of protecting uh, researchers who are evaluating the computer security or safety of technologies, or finding privacy violations in those technologies, we know that there is a strong interest among the companies and particularly the company's lawyers to prevent the publication of flaws about that product. Um, that, is, that is a financial incentive that is always going to be present unless you have someone independent evaluating the tool. So here's the punchline. FST had a function that wasn't disclosed to, uh, to anybody, um, and it had the potential to skew the results against a criminal defendant, right? So say that this person is probably guilty, in essence, uh, when that was not true, right? By connecting them to some key piece of evidence that has DNA on it. Now, th this doesn't seem to have been a nefarious uh, deed by the creators of the tool. It seems like they thought they were fixing or they did fix one thing, but created this other uh, erroneous process and didn't realize it and didn't know that it was there. So they didn't do any subsequent um, evaluations of the tool. So it was only discovered. And remember, we have peer reviewed papers, we have validation studies, we have testimony from the people making the tool. It was only discovered when um, Johnson's legal team was able to get the code disclosed to them and their expert figured it out, right? And then once they talked about it, ProPublica was able to move and get the code released to them, which ultimately the public does have an interest in knowing how criminal punishment is being done in our name. And the, the first step of this battleground is just getting it in the hands of the defense team. So that will typically happen subject to what's called a protective order. And that is an order from the court um, telling you not to share it. So you can't republish it. Um, you typically can't talk about uh, all of its contents. These things, the orders are um, written for that instance. So there's not a, a general protective order that, that has fixed rules for every case. Um, but the, the essence of it is it's limited who gets to see it. And so that is to accommodate the vendor's interest in secrecy um, and essentially make it more palatable for the judge to order disclosure. So, uh, but once they discovered it, they were able to use it um, in, in their motions. Journalists were able to see it. 
get it public. And since then, it's been a really powerful example where you had all of these assurances from the vendor. Um, and yet, once you got to independent review, you found a very serious um, and unknown flaw. So since then, we have had um, two great decisions that I previewed earlier. Uh, one is a New Jersey state court case, um, which really understood these issues and went into it in a lot of detail um, and went on to be clearly influential in Ellis, the second case I'll talk about. Um, but as a practical matter, the judge ordered disclosure and the prosecution just said, all right, we're not going to use that evidence. So we don't have to give you anything because we're just, we've decided not to use it. Um, and that is not an uncommon way of evading a bad um, legal precedent. So we saw that a ton in the Fourth Amendment context where the government would collect information um, without a warrant. And uh, if, if they were worried that they might lose, they would just drop that evidence um, so that they wouldn't get bad precedent restricting their powers to go and collect that kind of evidence in the first place. So um, that case was a little bit of a roller coaster. We got this great win, and then we don't actually get to see the code. Now, in um, this Ellis case out of Pennsylvania, this is the first federal case considering the issue, which is really more important than it sounds in the sense that um, it's not binding on subsequent courts elsewhere, but it's potentially influential because you've got a judge who has already thought through the issues, and you can sort of lean on their reasoning. Um, and be persuaded by it. So there we, we got another order of disclosure and it effectively has not yet occurred. They're fighting about it. So they got, a, they got a binary blob and they got what sounds like a bunch of um, incomplete and disconnected code libraries that uh, do not form the tool. So they are in the process of trying to get the judge to compel the um, vendor to actually give them what the judge ordered. So um, we haven't gotten to peek under the hood of true allele yet, but uh, we do have orders <laughs> concerning its disclosure. But these are sort of third level legal tactics of a prosecution dropping a thing after you get a victory um, that are, um, not going to be the focus, but are important to know about because we're going to be talking about sort of different limits of theories of change. So what can we generalize here? Uh, in criminal prosecutions, we have some extra legal tools. Um, and that's good because it's high stakes with powerful actors. Um, this, this analysis isn't just for DNA, but other technologies for collecting, analyzing evidence, generating leads. And we are having um, success using existing legal frameworks to achieve a form of protection for the people who would otherwise be subject to these technologies. And um, there is a legislative proposal by Congressman Takano that um, would essentially uh, create legislatively some of these rights that we have to fight for on the basis of more general constitutional protections. So. I'm going to talk more about the government, but here they are not trying to put you in jail. They are instead determining whether you're entitled to a government benefit uh, or how much of it you get. And here again, you have a due process right to a fair and explainable decision. And I'm going to center the conversation around a case uh, from Arkansas, where the Arkansas Legal Aid Society did really great work um, for Ethel Jacobs and um, and it's, it's, uh, it's sort of a helpful path for remedying existing harms. So we don't always know when an agency decides to adopt an algorithmic tool, uh, and organizations like legal aid societies will just get an uptick, uptick in clients who need help, who are all experiencing the same thing, and eventually deduce that something has changed. Um, and you know, in some cases, that's the adoption of an algorithmic tool. So this example, and the reason why I have this um, elderly cat on the right, 
is that um, the, the program at issue was a government program for providing some amount of hours of at-home care for people with disabilities. Uh, and for um, Esther Jacobs, the plaintiff in this case, uh, it was dementia. She was a 93-year-old woman who needed um, someone to come in and help her um, take care of herself. So in this case, it's a, it's a life and death scenario, um, but your government benefits, it need not be a life and death scenario for you to have access to these, these legal tools. So um, you get the legal tool when you have a government agency that's making decisions that impact people and you get a due process right that attaches and you get to have a hearing, you get to make them explain themselves, challenge the decision. Um, and so a big limit of this tool that I'm going to talk about uh, is that it doesn't apply to um, private actors usually. So there are gonna be edge cases, but um, you can't just go to um, Facebook and say, you know, I have a due process right to uh, challenge your decision to suspend my account, whatever. Um, but we can use the lessons that we learn um, in order to inform both legal and um, activist approaches to those kinds of systems as well. So I'm gonna just briefly take a moment to uh, make fun of the use of AI as a term in marketing. Uh, it is used very broadly um, and it seems to mean statistics. If your tool uses statistics, you market it as an AI tool. Um, and in reality, sometimes it's more like the tool in Arkansas where it was essentially a buggy spreadsheet. Um, so uh, you, you can, you, I don't know how that tool was marketed, but it's not uncommon to you know, hear a lot of puffery around the technology that's used and then wind up very disappointed. If you were looking forward um, in the context of that case to having a cool debate about machine learning and models and training data, and then you discover it's a spreadsheet, um, you're gonna be disappointed. But in this case, it wasn't just a spreadsheet, it was a buggy spreadsheet. And um, it just didn't account for one of the conditions that a person could have. Um, and the result was really bittersweet in the sense that they won their case and then this 93 year old woman who had been denied the care that she needed died within days. So when I say that these are life and death stakes, they really are. And we, we want to intervene sooner than that. We don't want um, to only be able to help someone when they're experiencing harm already. We want to be able to intervene before that happens. And I am now going to say administrative law in a tone that no one has ever been so excited to talk about administrative law before, because this is a tool that potentially lets us prevent that harm instead of um, trying to only help people who are experiencing the harm already. So this is, this is a different but related um, method of change. The key case here is yet to be determined uh, because I want to sue somebody about it. But in any event, um, the, the, the state of the law is that an agency has to provide public notice and comment before changing the rules. Um, and then the proposition that I believe is true and need a court to say is that when you adopt a new algorithmic tool that is part of your decision making, that is creating a new rule for the purposes of administrative law. So why is it a rule? Um, well, a rule is something that has general applicability and adjudicates people's rights or benefits. And you follow a process to make these decisions. You have to have a standard. Uh, you have to have a process to make the decision. And when you use an algorithmic tool, part of that process, part of that rule ultimately is what is written into the code in terms of rules of you know, how many points does this condition get you and how much care does that get you? Um, and sometimes these are not identical with the rules that are written into the statute. So 
sometimes they're actually in direct contradiction or they bought the tool and then the statute changed and then they haven't updated it. Um, or sometimes the statute just isn't as specific as you have to be when you're writing something in software. And so the real rule is what's written into the software. And fortunately, we have some precedent that um, you don't actually have to follow the algorithm 100% of the time. There's some EPA case law where they had an algorithm for computing a threshold and it was followed 90 plus percent of the time. That was good enough. Um, so we don't actually need a situation where there's no human in the loop. Um, you can have a human, but if as a practical matter, they are um, doing what the algorithm says or under some regimes, because this varies um, this varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, under some regimes, just if it has an impact on their decision, then you potentially um, can use this legal tool to force a stage of community engagement and transparency. That's what it gets us. When you go through notice and comment, you have to say what the new rule is going to be, um, which in the cases where you have a rule that's more specific than the statute embodied in the code is then you're getting transparency that you didn't have before. Um, and once we establish that this is uh, something that an agency has to do, they can't just buy a new algorithm like they would buy a printer. Um, they actually have to engage in, engage with the people who are going to be subject to the technology. Um, so once we know that they are required to do that, then we will talk about how much detail is required in the notice um, and uh, sort of what we want to say in those comments. But it also intrinsically provides time to mobilize. So you are not in the situation of figuring out after the fact something harmful has happened um, and then trying to remedy it. Um, so I want to make sure we have time for questions. So I'm gonna go a little bit faster through some of this, um, but I do want to talk a little bit about um, the private use of these technologies. And so private here uh, is not in the privacy sense, but in the um, sense that we are not talking about governments using it. So we talked about criminal prosecutions, we talked about administration of benefits. And the fact is that there are limited legal avenues under current law to, um, to achieve these, these forms of accountability. So we've got <clears throat> some state laws involving privacy. Uh, we've got some involving um, the, the uses to which these systems can be put. Um, there are several different international approaches put forward. So GDPR in Europe about privacy, Brazil is considering uh, privacy rules. Um, China recently published a list of um, sort of principles for governing um, platforms that use algorithms, which are half authoritarian, um, you know, don't help dissidents and so on, and half sort of a thoughtful look at what they need to know to understand the tool, um, including things like, uh, the, the metrics that would provide meaningful transparency into a complex um, algorithmic tool. And there's a general framework of human rights obligations, which um, abroad can put affirmative obligations on private companies and not just governments. I'm gonna briefly talk about Clearview. This is a, a company that runs facial recognition on photos from the internet and sells its services to the police. Uh, the ACLU and others sued them because this is a gross invasion of privacy and it's used to suppress social movements and activists. Um, and so Clearview argued they have a First Amendment right to um, analyze these photos and then tell the police about it. Uh, and that is actually a really interesting um, First Amendment tangle that we do not have time to go into. The short answer is the First Amendment is implicated, but the regulation is nonetheless appropriate. So, so the fact that something is First Amendment protected does not automatically mean you can't have any laws about it. It means that you apply some level of scrutiny. Um, and typically when you have something um, running up against another fundamental right, you'll get into that kind of scrutiny test and um, figure out if the approach that was taken uh, is appropriately tailored to the harm to that other fundamental right and so on. Um, very happy to talk more about that when we have more time. Um, 
So to sort of connect the privacy regulations to this problem, the theory is that uh, you will limit the harm that can be done by these systems if you limit the supply of data that's most useful for exploitation. So information about what you are clicking everywhere uh, and that can be used to um, manipulate you personally. Um, and so these privacy protections will let you opt into things as long as that consent is really meaningful. It's not a deceptive little button where you can't tell if it's on or off. It's not a click through agreement. Um, and that's not a complete solution that does not obviously uh, speak to all of the potential uses of these systems. Um, so all of this has been an important but incomplete toolkit about what we can do, what we can fight for. But there's another um, consideration, which is, should it exist, right? Um, so you, there are a bunch of technologies um, that just either that, that should not be used in um, particular ways categorically. So predictive policing, for instance, you're going to train an AI on a bunch of racist historical policing data and then set it loose to try to recreate those outcomes. Just don't do that. That's not, that's not science and it's not just. Um, so why do I have to say this? Uh, the answer is that um, there, there's a powerful thread of the idea that the progress of technology inevitably leads to better outcomes. Um, and I sort of glibly will say that was just a happy coincidence between the printing press and, uh, and the internet, but that's, don't hold me to that. Um, but it's just, it's essentially just not true. Um, we actually have to do some work to make sure that new technologies are deployed in ways that promote justice instead of uh, promoting oppression and entrenching existing power structures. And then the second reason I have to say this is um, it's very common to see a proposal that we take an approach of risk mitigation. We're never going to prevent all of the risks, so we're going to minimize it and then go ahead. Um, and that's really at odds with the idea that there are some deployments of these tools that shouldn't happen. It's not just we should minimize the risk. It's either not fit for purpose or it's an illegitimate purpose. Uh, and um, it would just be harmful uh, to go ahead and then minimize it after the fact. Um, this is a paper that I'm just going to tell you to go read. Uh, so Oskies and... Um, their collaborators put together this delightful little paper, um, essentially highlighting the limits of a fairness, accountability, and transparency framework. The idea is this is an algorithm where a drone will fly up to old people and determine whether it's socially beneficial to mulch them. Um, and the, it sort of goes through, well, our first iteration mulched more white people and cis people and clearly that's not right. So to decrease bias, we ramped up the degree that it mulches other demographics. Um, and then you can appeal it to a human operator of the drone. Um, it's sort of uh, a really engaging uh, way to lead you through the questions of, uh, or illustrate the extent to which you can get drawn into questions that are not the point. Talked about that. Um, so now I want to talk about the, the role of technologists. So the twist here is I've been talking about all of these um, legal approaches, and you may have noticed that there are big gaps where they do not solve the problem. Um, and that's because there is no theory of change or tool of change that achieves uh, big results on its own. Uh, it's always part of a broader infrastructure of social justice. So technology, making technology is not apolitical. I think if you are here, you understand that, you know, if you are not thinking about the, the political consequences, you are entrenching a status quo. Uh, we have studies that show just showing technologists an ethical framework doesn't, doesn't uh, achieve the outcomes that we want. Um, but technologists are trained to think about really complex problems and uh, think of solutions. So those solutions can be outside of existing power structures. And again, I think if you are here, you know this, this isn't news to you, but let me um, revisit. Well, I'm not going to revisit this because I want to answer your questions. 
Um, but I will give you a moment to appreciate this cute cat. Um, this, this person who has been photographed in a lineup is using a privacy technology of pasting a cute cat over their face. Um, and uh, essentially what I was saying is that, you know, like other theories of change, using the law is kind of at its best when it's supporting another approach or used in concert with other approaches. So it can be appealing and fun and easier to tweak and improve systems. Um, but sometimes we need to aim higher than tweaking an existing system. So you know, if you think, for instance, that US criminal law and policing are unjust, uh, is it missing the point if you argue about the fitness of algorithmic tools? And um, you know, to that, I would answer, it would only be missing the point if that's all people were thinking about and weren't also working on other approaches. So I think direct client services are really important um, and also feed into and benefit from in both directions, um, impact litigation and um, legal work that is aimed at protecting acts of organizing. So for instance, um, you know, at the core of this are people who have needs, who have ideas, who are organizing. Um, and you know, back in 2017, um, we, had, we had won under the Obama administration some really unexpectedly good net neutrality regulations. Um, and it was the week that Trump was being inaugurated and a reporter asked me, how are you get, going to get people to stay focused on the issue of net neutrality? I'm like, I'm not, that's not why we did it. We care about net neutrality so that social movements can continue to use the internet in an unhindered way to organize um, you know, towards other ends. It is not the end in itself. And I would like everyone to go and use the freedoms that uh, they have to achieve other social change. And if you can spare a moment to try to make sure that net neutrality is still there for you the next time you need it, that's great. But I don't want people focused on, um, on that as their chief goal. Um, and I know that you, you, a bunch of the organizations involved in this program are doing really great work to connect technologists and um, the organizations that are on the front lines protecting people's uh, rights and addressing people's needs. So thank you all of you who are involved in doing that. Um, like I said, the, there is an infrastructure to social justice uh, that includes all of our disciplines and organizations and uh, really glad to be here and um, be making more connections in service of that and uh, looking forward to your questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Kit. Um, we now have time for some audience questions. You can send your questions via the Q&A box below in Zoom. Um, for our live audiences in the Siebel Center for Design, iSchool, and CS, feel free to use a question strip and return that to the room host. Please indicate what department, unit, or organization you're from when you submit your question. Uh, Anita and I will moderate, and I will read aloud our first question from the audience. Um, first question is from Neil Stenover, and apologies for my mispronunciation. Um, the title of the talk mentions human rights. Um, your talk seems to primarily focus on US constitutional rights. Could you elaborate on where human rights come in and how this is applicable outside of the US? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, so the constitutional rights of due process um, and you know, right to a fair trial are things that are reflected in international human rights frameworks as well. I am a US lawyer and so my focus is on um, pursuing those values in the context of US law. But I also very much um, wanted to include a broad frame in terms of who are the people that we are talking about. We're talking about people who advocate for human rights and that's not a profession necessarily, that's an action that everybody can do. So um, to talk, hmm, can I, can I talk about the international human rights framework in, um, in this period of time? So I think um, the, there is there so there is a, a sort of detailed approach to um, 
the governance of algorithmic systems that is in process in the EU that has um, some promising elements as, as well as some limitations, including the uh, risk mitigation approach that I talked about. So we and a number of European organizations um, organized by Panopticon uh, submitted comments about uh, you know, ways in which that framework was limited. Uh, but yes, outside the US, um, going directly to international human rights norms has a lot more influence than it does domestically. And so for instance, the privacy of legislation that's being considered in uh, Brazil that speaks directly to the use of your data in decision-making systems, the right to, um, to know when that is happening, to correct errors if that's something that you want to do, to make sure that it doesn't happen without meaningful consent, while also providing protections for activities like journalism um, is very much rooted in uh, human rights framing by advocates. So um, that is not a complete answer to your question, um, but all of this is fundamentally about the protection of human rights. And it's just thought about very differently in the United States where we have to, we have to find a route for it in um, existing legal protections like the constitution or legislation. I should have mentioned that uh, Niels is from University of Netherlands. Um, sorry for neglecting that earlier. Uh, Amsterdam, University of Amsterdam, <laughs> apologies. Uh, and the next question comes to us um, from Jorge Rojas, who is a PhD candidate at the Institute of Communications Research and um, also who's sending over this question from the Siebel Center for Design. Uh, and he asked, could you suggest strategies to enroll state legislators to participate in projects involving AI technologies and social justice? Um, I'm thinking in particular about a specific current project uh, I'm involved in, he writes to provide information resources for first responders to attend to individuals in mental health crises. In this case, we want support from legislators to attend to more ethical implementations of uh, a prototype involving predictive technologies. But of course, there are other um, examples of deployments where more pernicious forms of surveillance are involved. Um, any known cases or experiences you know of as a reference would be very welcome. Yeah, well, I'm trying to think if there is an example of that kind of use, because unfortunately, a lot of the um, education of legislators has been at a slightly more fundamental um, level. But I love the approach of <clears throat> trying to steer uh, a legislator who is interested in doing something techie and or doing something for the community, steering them into um, the kind of a deployment that, that is actually going to help the community rather than additional funding for policing and so on. Um, so I don't, I don't think I have an example of that, but um, it definitely helps to join forces with another existing movement, right? Like the, the movement that is substantively working on those rights. So in many contexts, in terms of um, algorithmic uh, discrimination in hiring or employment, then um, labor organizations are great allies for that. Um, and that is that actually often have the experience themselves of sort of which legislators are sympathetic, uh, how to approach them in a way that, um, you know, trying to approach it from the technology side, there are some lawmakers who um, their identity is connected to being tech experts um, or, you know, presenting themselves as tech experts who uh, are also an audience for that. But, um, and ideally you would find someone who is interested in both of those things. But um, mm -hmm. I think, again, those connections between different arms of the reform effort and uh, taking cues from 
the community who have sort of been working on the substantive questions for some time. Uh, the next question is from Zach Gilhoffer, a PhD candidate at the I school at UIC. Um, they ask, referring to slide six, how do you feel about the EU's proposal for regulation on AI, particularly how it bans certain highest risk AI systems and requires more stringent controls for high risk AI, for example, AI used in the workplace or producing legal effects? So there are a few frameworks, um, sort of you know, coexisting frameworks that are reflected in the um, EU regulations. And um, there's one in particular that I have a bunch of thoughts about, which is um, the one that puts sort of the stakes of the system on one axis and the, auto the sort of systems autonomy or the human involvement on um, the other axis. And I actually think that the stakes of the system are um, significantly more important than uh, how much a human is involved. So I think you know, it does matter if you have fully automated systems, um, then they can spin out of control very quickly, you know, faster than a human can act. But um, as I was talking about in the context of um, the administrative protections, the difference between a system that informs or recommends a person's action versus um, one that tells them what action to take uh, is not as great a distinction. Um, and I think, I think it should not be given as much weight as that sort of first framework that is um, presented in the um, in, in that analysis gives it. In terms of the sort of bans on particular technologies, um, you know, I think there are contexts where it makes sense to ban certain technologies because the potential for abuse is too great. Um, but again, that conversation, um, you know, there, there are often beneficial uses to a technology. And um, I think in particular, this is relevant when you're talking about who is responsible for a harm that results from the use of, um, of an algorithmic tool. And that, you know, again, it's a very lawyer answer, but you know, that, that really depends on the context, both because there are situations, it's actually very common um, you know, outside of this context for um, a technologist to create a tool that has multiple uses, but one of them is potentially harmful or someone builds on it to make something harmful. And then you see a reaction of, trying to go after that original technology. And depending on the legal theory, um, there are different ways of sort of protecting that kind of um, technology that has both legitimate and illegitimate purposes. Um, so so you, you have both the scenario where it's the use of the tool that gives rise to the harm. Um, and then the less common scenario where the sort of intended function or um, market for the tool is intrinsically harmful um, and uh, or the flaws in it and the harm are actually concealed from and unknown to the entity deploying it, um, which can either be a fun selling point because now you can do discrimination under the guise of technological neutrality, or it can actually be something really unfortunate that the, the user wanted to get it right, um, but the software wasn't fit for purpose. Um, so I think all of those, all of those scenarios exist in the real world. I think the EU framework is not a terrible start, um, but it, it does have um, significant limitations and blind spots. And our next question is from John Weeble, who's a senior lecturer at the School of Information, of Information Sciences, um, who asks, when these companies balk at disclosure of source code and other proprietary aspects that are potentially wrong and surely biased, in addition to the reviews you mentioned, why don't courts require that the same analysis be, be performed using their competitors' tools as, an, as another layer of checking validity? 
and where it yeah. can be proven that the competitors aren't actually colluders? I love that question because um, in probabilistic genotyping, there is no right answer. Uh, you arrive at an estimate. So if you run it with a different tool, you will get a different answer. And that's just that's just how those tools work. Um, but uh, in in other contexts, right, like a breathalyzer, which is some of where some of the early case law around this came from, you are measuring something objective. You are measuring the parts per million of alcohol in the gas that is expelled from uh, the person's lungs. And there, um, there you can do that. But uh, I think what you raised is um, also feeds into the idea that it's silly and unfair to imagine that every criminal defendant is going to do this or have the responsibility to do this. Um, and, and that's true, right? Like they have the right to do it, but the, the world in which every criminal defendant who wants to challenge this tool has to hire their own expert after they're already um, you know, imprisoned uh, is um, is not the world that most protects them from injustice uh, of these tools. And so, ultimately, um, you know, while they they these rights are really important, we also want a system where there is um, an independent assessment of these tools as a general matter um, before it gets to the point where an individual defendant has to has to fight it. Um, so we are not sort of looking, we are looking for um, an authority outside of the parties that uh, can, can assess the tools, has real independent auditing power that doesn't supersede the defendant's right to challenge it. But if it's doing its job, then it is generating some reliable information that's going to inform the decision whether you fight for more access or not, or if the access is already out there, right? So the, the, the ultimate ideal is that the public actually, well, I'm not gonna say that's the ultimate ideal, but the, the local maximum uh, ideal where you know, we have this criminal punishment system, et cetera, et cetera, um, is that the public actually knows how it's happening um, and gets to see uh, or gets trusted third party auditors to adversarially analyze the tools that are being used to imprison people again as a local maximum while we are while we are in the world where that is the criminal punishment system. So we are going to conclude our Q&A series so that we can give our speaker a short break. There are several more questions that we can share with you, Kit. Um, I, that was wonderful. Um, I also want to take some time to thank our production team and invite them to a video. None of this would be possible without the back end work of Mitchell Oliver, Jing Yi Gu, Silas Xu, Tiffany Lee, Gabe Mallow, Jorge Rojas, Vinay Koshi, Sam Wilco, and our ASL translator, Brianne, from UIUC's DRES office. We also wanna thank Rachel Switsky and the Siebel Center for Design, the iSchool and the CS departments for accommodating our live broadcast in their spaces. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us today. A recording of this talk will be posted to our website. Join us again for our next event with Shoshana Zuboff on Wednesday, October 27. We hope to see you all there and bye for now. Oh, I should also thank Jeanette, uh, our, our second ASL interpreter. Okay, bye everyone.